Hey everybody, John Fenn here, once again with SupernaturalHouseChurch.org or CWOWI.org will get you there. ChurchWithoutWallsInternational.org will get you there as well. Today talking about why is it hard to swat a fly and God's timing. And I actually have a series this month entitled, Why Is It So Hard to Swat a Fly? But it just was quick into my heart to share this today because not everybody's on our mailing list or anything like that. Uh, nor interested, but this one little snippet may help somebody today. It was just quick into my heart to go ahead and share on this subject. Why is it hard to swat a fly? Well, the answer to that is from a study that was done about flies and why, you know, trying to answer that question. And they found out, the researchers found out that the, the fly, which lives a total of like six or eight or 12 weeks, their brain moves so fast that when a person moves in with the fly swatter to the fly, it's like the person is moving in slow motion. So it's kind of like we're, we, we would say in our time, I'm going to get you, fly. And, and to the fly, it's like, Whoa. The, you know, they see us moving in slow motion because they operate their, to them time. Their whole lifespan is spent in six or eight or 12 weeks. And, and so time moves very fast for them. We have time moving at a different scale. So to, to, to the fly, a person looks like they are moving in slow motion, even though in reality, we're moving as fast as we can to try to zap that fly. But to the fly, we're moving in slow motion. And that is great illustration for the way the Lord is. You know, the Lord said in John chapter 8, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And Jesus called himself the I am on several different occasions. That is the one who, who moves freely through time, the, the ever-present one. The way the Lord explained it to me in a, in, during a visitation and some explanation was that our life is like a tabletop and uh, like a line going from one end of the table to the other. And he's standing above that line. So he's looking down on a timeline so to him, the start and the end are the same because he's up above it and he can, he can, he can flow through that. He can, he can observe that, you know, all as aspects of that timeline. We're moving from birth and we're moving across a timeline to the end of the table, but he's up above it. Now, this is explained in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. It's the only time the Lord makes an outright statement about eternity. He says, I am the lofty one, the high and mighty God who inhabit eternity. I inhabit eternity and he says, and the humble heart. And so Isaiah 57, uh, 17, or excuse me, Isaiah 57, 15 says that he lives both in eternity, inhabits eternity, and in the humble heart. And that, as they say, is the rub. Because the great I am, the one who moves independent of time, the one who, who, who speaks out of the I am, also lives in our heart. And so what happens is his time frame is ever present. It's actually, there's a scripture in Ezekiel 39 and I think verse six, and I covered in that series, why is it so hard to swat a fly? But the Lord says this, and he's actually talking about an upcoming war of World War III, but uh, what we would call World War III. But in Ezekiel 39, six, he says this, he says, behold, it, is, it has come, it is done in the day that I speak it, it is done. See, from the Lord's perspective, as soon as he speaks, it, it's a done deal. I mean, he's above that timeline. He's above that table. He can see it all. He's, he's up above it. He's looking down on it. It's a done deal because he speaks it forth. But to, he lives in eternity. That's the speech from eternity. That's how he views it from eternity. But to us, we live in the here and now. He also inhabits our humble heart. And so let me give you an example of the way this works out. When God speaks to us, when he gives us a promise, let's say it's, it, he gives you a promise that your children will be saved. Let's say he gives you a promise that you're going to, to head up an orphanage in some distant land, or that you're gonna to travel to, to some distant nation, or you're gonna travel the nations. And, and, and he, when he speaks that, it's as good as done. But in our hearts, we're thinking, what's going on with my life? How am I ever gonna get from point A to point Z? How am I ever gonna get there? Well, here's the thing, the Apostle Paul, in, in Acts chapter 26 and verse 17, Paul is relaying his testimony to King Agrippa. And he says this, that the Lord told him at his conversion, this is, this is in a, around the year 35 when Paul gets saved. And the, and the Lord told him, he said, I'm going to deliver you from the people and the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. So the Lord told him at his conversion that when he believed on Jesus, when Jesus confronted him on the way to Damascus, the Lord told him, I'm delivering you from the people and the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. Now that again happened in the year 35. 
And, and what did Paul do? Because it says now, now I'm, now I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Now I'm sending you. If it's you and I, we was like, oh man, I've got to pack my bags. I've got, to, I've got to make my preparation. I've got to do this right away. But when you read Paul's own words in Galatians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, Paul says that after that experience, he said, I, I went into the deserts of Arabia for three years. I received revelation from the Lord. I was taught by the Lord. I spent three years just, just learning and growing. And then when you look at the timeline, uh, the next thing that happened to Paul is in Acts chapter 11 when uh, he's in Antioch and uh, Barnabas invites him up to teach the people. That's in about the year 41. That's something like six years after Paul gets saved. And that's the first opportunity he's had to minister to the Gentiles. And we would say, hold it. At his conversion, the Lord said, I'm delivering you from the, from the people and the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. But it was six years before it ever happened. And if you want to flash forward even more to Paul's first, what we call Paul's first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, that was almost a decade after Paul gets saved. That's, that's, that's almost a decade. That's about eight years or so at least uh, bef you know, after he gets saved. So, so we sit here and we, and we receive from God and he says, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm sending you here. And to us it feels now. And because of that, so many people have, have even died. So many people have, have made mistakes, have wondered what's, what's going on with God because God told me this. And so I acted on it and, and then it all fell apart and nothing worked out. Where did I miss God? What's going on? And it's because God speaks from eternity. He inhabits eternity, but he also inhabits our heart. But when eternity speaks into our heart, it feels like now you've got to act now, but that's okay. It's just his perspective. It's not much different than a parent telling a child about something that is very adult and to the to the the parent, they're they're saying, child, you know, you've got to wait. You know, I'm telling you this now that you're going to to go to school and you're going to be successful and you're going to do all these things. But to that child, it's like, yeah, I want to do that right now. And the parents like, hold it, you got a whole lot of time in between, but you are going to be successful as that parent speaks over that child. But it's just got to play out over time. Another example is Moses. Stephen tells us in Acts chapter seven, verses twenty two through twenty five that it says that Moses was educated in all the ways of the Egyptians. He was trained in the ways of the Egyptians. The, the Jewish historian Josephus would later tell us that, that Moses was a, a, an army general. He was successful in the southern border of, of Egypt. The movie The Ten Commandments picks up on what Josephus wrote. Whether it's true or not, we don't know. All Stephen tells us in Acts 7.22 is Moses was educated in all the ways of the Egyptians. But he goes on to say in verses 23, 24, and 25, he said, when Moses was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, when he was 40 years old. And, he, and Stephen goes on to say, he killed the Egyptian when one of them suffered wrong. And he killed the Egyptian, buried him in the, in the sand. And Stephen says this, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them but they understood not. In other words, at 40 years of age, Moses had the revelation he was the deliverer. And he, in his training, in his military training, in his education, he just thought, I'm going to help God here. I'm going to cause a civil uprising. I'm going to kill this Egyptian. Everyone's going to rally around me, and we're going to, we're going to have a civil war in Egypt, and, and I'm going to take God's people out. And, and he knew that at age 40. It's not like the movie portrays it. He has the burning bush experience and it's brand new to him. No, 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 not at all. He knew at age 40. But that mistake of getting ahead of God, of trying to help God, of having a revelation from God and then saying, hmm, how can I help God bring this to pass? Or isn't this going to happen right now? It feels like the here and now. That mistake cost him one third of his life. He had the revelation at age 40, but it was at age 80 that he had the burning bush experience. And God said, hey, Moses, you know, it's not going to be by civil war. Throw down your stick and watch it become a snake and pick it up again. You know, it's going to be through the supernatural signs and wonders that God gets the glory, not Moses and his education. And so my encouragement for you today, I mean, I could go on and on and all and on, but just to say that if you've received a revelation from the Lord, maybe your loved one's going to be saved. Maybe you're going to go to some distant land or something of that nature. Uh, then realize God speaks from eternity. He speaks from the I am, and he puts it into our heart. And so it feels like it's got to happen now that you need to do something. I would encourage you to be more like Moses and, and uh, or not make the mistake of Moses, but, but to wait and receive the revelation, then receive part two. Abraham also uh, received revelation and he tried to help God. I go into that in the series, why is it so hard to swallow a fly, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I just bring that up to mention, but I, I just believe it. It's on my heart that this is for somebody today and it will help people uh, to realize that you've got the promises of God. They are sure and they are secure 
And it really doesn't matter whether it comes to pass now or in 100 years or 500 years in your glorified body. It's going to come to pass. But just don't get caught up in helping God, realizing, trying to, you know, help him along. Receive the revelation. Praise God that your child's going to be saved. Praise God you're going to go to that distant land. Just realize it will come to pass, but you don't have to make it come to pass. Life will go along and it will happen, uh, you know, in the Lord's timing. So be encouraged in that. And that explains why it's so hard to swat a fly, because God moves at a, a different realm, a different speed than we do to him. As soon as he speaks it, it's done. To us, we have to walk it out. We have to do what's right in the natural. And when we do what's right in the natural, the Lord will steer us along the right path. All right. God bless. Talk to you next time.